Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia, a nonpartisan think tank. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our program. Uh, uh, today we have um, the author, he's a Templeton Fellow, Phil Wojcicki, talking about a recent report he wrote, Will, this, Will Russia Survive Until 2084? For those of us who read the uh, Andre Amalric essay in our school days, this title sounds familiar. Anyway, um, here joining us as the moderator uh, is uh, Maya Otarashvili, who is the deputy director of our Eurasia program. Um, before I hand the reins over to Maya, I'd like to once again thank our sponsors, our donors, and our board for all they do to support us and make FDRI um, possible. And to uh, tell those of you who are listening but aren't in one of those categories to consider becoming a donor to FPRI, a donor and or a member. Uh, we can't survive without your support, so I encourage you to um, take action today on that. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Maya. As Riley mentioned, today we're um, who this year will also be serving as a special Eurasia Fellow at FPRI. He's a former paramilitary case officer who had a 31-year career in the Directorate Operations of the Central Intelligence Agency. He was a member of the first CIA team into Afghanistan in 2001 and served a three-year assignment on the National Security Council staff as the Director for Intelligence and covert action programs. Um, he has a very long and rich bio that is available on our website, along with the report that he has just published earlier this year with FPRI. So I invite all of you to check out this report and uh, see Phil's bio and his um, rather vast publication track record with FPRI, although he only joined us a couple of years ago. Um, so I won't take too much longer. I just want to, again, reiterate the title, the very provocative title of today's talk and of this very popular report that FPRI recently published, Will Russia survive until 2084? Um, I will ask Phil to introduce this report to us in his own words. He will speak for about 10 minutes. Then I have a couple follow-up questions that I'm dying to get the answers to. And then of course, as always, I would really like to bring in the audience into this discussion. Please use the Q&A feature to send in any and all of your questions, and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. With that, let me turn it over to Phil. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining us today. Thank you for yet another really interesting and exciting report, and I cannot wait for us to get into it. Well, thank you very much, Raleigh, for that nice introduction, and Maya, good to see you again. Um, as you've mentioned, the, the title of my article pays homage to Andrei Amalric's famed essay, Will the Soviet Union Survive Till 1984? And as Amalric did with the Soviet Union, I try and look forward into this century uh, regarding the future of the Russian Federation, especially regarding its territorial integrity. And my article uh, is based on the following argument. If there is uh, widespread uh, disorder in the Soviet Union, we could see history repeating itself as such as a century ago. What would bring this about? My first argument is that if the Russian army is defeated in Ukraine, this means the Russian army collapses and or possibly both the Ukrainians retake Crimea, that this will be the catalyst for widespread political unrest inside the Russian Federation and that this unrest could cause um, pressure to remove Putin from power. If, um, if the first rule of politics is thou shalt stay in power, then those around Putin will possibly decide to remove him so that there's leadership change to um, deal with this public unrest rather than having regime change. Remove the leader rather than have public unrest get out of hand and it'd be uncontrollable so that these people who are collectively known as the Siloviki and others who make up the various different factions in Russia's ruling class themselves do not lose power, do not lose their, uh, their wealth, their security, their positions. Um, 
this has been commented upon by, by several authors, the possibility of a coup is openly speculated upon. In my report, what I ask the question is, if this is to happen, however, what makes us suppose that any coup attempt would go smoother or be any better organized than the war to date in, in Ukraine? A couple of options here. Even if the coup attempt succeeds and Putin is removed from power, there is no designated successor. There's a legal one, but it, it's Russian constitution is written in pencil. So it's going to be who the Kremlin insiders decide. But Putin, without Putin, who is balanced between these factions, many of them who have um, represent armed forces within the Russian Federation, without Putin to balance, what does it say after a coup? These various different factions wouldn't fight amongst themselves. Today, Russia is awash in a number of armed groups. Naturally, have the army, the special forces, Roskvardia, the FSB, the MVD, the police. And these have units literally throughout the entire country. To this, we must add in the Wagner group, uh, the Chechens and that. What if political violence initially focused on the Kremlin and removing Putin from the Kremlin uh, gets unleashed in a broader struggle as each group vies for power against the other? Another option would be is that a, uh, a coup against Putin is only partly successful. Putin survives, is able to gather his followers, his own supporters, and then you have the coup forces and the forces loyal to Putin fighting amongst each other. This is a recipe, and we've seen this before in, in Russia, uh, and I'll use the words, civil war. The world was really lucky in 1991 when the Soviet Union crashed relatively peacefully. Uh, we may not be so lucky again. As I write in my article, if you look at the history, the last 250 years of Russian and Soviet history, changes of power in the Kremlin have been caused by or have resulted in assassinations, military coups, attempted military coups, uh, curious medical events. Um, and also history has shown us that lost wars in Russia often lead to revolution or leadership changes. And I see no reason why this war should be any exception. That's my first argument. My second argument is what could be one of the immediate consequences of such widespread chaos in, in Russia? And one of the things that I posit is that this could motivate some, if not many, of the ethnic national republics within the Russian Federation to try and secede. Now, the last time Moscow lost power of, a, of the country, meaning the Soviet Union, all 14 constituent ethnic Soviet socialist republics seceded, and they've become independent states, and Russia considers them that's near abroad. And they are, now, um, they are now individual countries. What if this happens again with, if there's chaos, internal chaos, even civil war that rages in Russia? Uh, this all came close to happening in the 90s with the Chechen Republic. And it took two wars to squash Chechen independence. And the other republics, especially Tatarstan, that saw what happened were, um, shall we say, um, given incentives not to try this again. However, the crushing of the Chechen independence movement took almost the entire weight of the Russian army and its security services, its paramilitary forces to do so. If the army is destroyed in Ukraine, along with the paramilitary forces, if the security services also, like Russ Guardia, suffer heavy losses, what instruments of coercion would Moscow have to keep and ethnic national republics in line and not try and secede. If we look at the map, many of these ethnic uh, republics have borders, uh, border international uh, uh, borders uh, with Georgia, Azerbaijan, Mongolia, and other places. So this is a second argument I make. It's possible, I'm not saying it will happen, but it's possible. Next argument I make is even if the ethnic republics do not try and secede from the Russian Federation, despite whatever chaos may come, from losing a war. We will see those of the newly independent, after 30 years, I don't think we call them newly independent states anymore, but those states that left the Soviet Union and Russia considered part of its near abroad and sphere of influence to continue to uh, spin away from Moscow's control and orient themselves and also depend on their security 
from other powers along Russia's periphery as, as has been historic. Uh, this has already happened in the Western part of the former Soviet Union when the Baltics joined NATO. Um, Ukraine as a result of this war will definitely be a Western oriented country and Moldova will have to see. But it's also now applying definitely in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. In the Caucasus, uh, Turkey is now uh, one of the guarantors of security in the South Caucasus, as we've seen in the recent war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. It's also become, uh, again, it's also reasserted its, its power in the Black Sea as a result of this war in Ukraine. And in Central Asia, you see, again, you see Turkish power reasserting itself, but you also see Chinese power. And this is uh, what I'd really like to concentrate on. Because if the most important geopolitical event regarding Eurasian security in 2022 was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I believe the second most important event happened in the fall of 2022 when President Xi of China visited uh, Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan, as you know, its territorial integrity has been threatened since its inception of, by Russians, including Putin himself in 2014. Uh, made re remarks, and I'm sure there have been even more remarks made in private. And China, which heretofore had been an economic power in Central Asia, but not really considered part of the security system, uh, changed this with one sentence from President Xi. And I, I'd like to read that sentence if I can. And what he said is, no matter how the international situation changes, China will always support Kazakhstan in maintaining its national independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. That was directly aimed at Moscow, saying, hands off. And this was a humiliation for, for Moscow, because China has both the power and the will, if necessary, to back up those words. And then what happened later in the SCO summit in Samarkand showed that President Xi and President Erdogan of Turkey were the main figures, were the key figures in that meeting. And it was almost a ceremonial recognition uh, that Russia's era as a sole hegemon in Central Asia and the Caucasus was over. Certainly this was a humiliation for Russia, but besides the humiliating aspect of this, there also had to be an element of fear in Russian calculations of wondering what else might China want uh, around its periphery? Would it be content to be the main security guarantor in Central Asia now? Or does it have other goals, especially in light of the growing disparity in China and Russia's relative strengths in the Far East, economically, militarily, and demographically, uh, turning the balance of power in Beijing's uh, favor? Uh, now, some people may consider this, this is going out there, uh, this is crazy talk to be, you know, to be blunt. Uh, China and Russia are allies, close allies. Uh, this is not going to happen. I would say that Russia certainly wants to present a facade that Russia and China are, um, are allies. You dig a little bit deeper, uh, you will see that there are definite differences between the two countries. You dig even deeper into the history of their relations, you will see that for most of the modern era, the past 400 years, China and Russia have had a very antagonistic relationship usually based on territorial disputes. China today, its Communist Party, has ditched Marxist-Leninism as its sense of, as its um, reason for legitimacy, and instead has embraced nationalism, ultranationalism, to legitimize its control over the Chinese people. And one of its driving forces today is to end the um, losses of territory for what the Chinese call the century of humiliation due to a number of unequal treaties, such as the unequal treaty that gave Hong Kong the British. They've regained Macau, they've regained um, Hong Kong. Uh, they are trying to bring Taiwan back under its wing. But two unequal treaties were signed in 1858 in Aigun and 1860 in Beijing, which gave over a million square miles of Chinese territory north of the Amur River uh, to Russia. And these are still considered unequal treaties by the Chinese, to the extent that Chairman Mao even raised the issue with Premier Khrushchev when they met in the 50s. It's not ancient history for them. 
So my article raises the question regarding Russia and China relationships as the century unfolds, is what if the real Thucydides trap in the 21st century, which per political scientist Graham Allison is a rising power supplanting an established one, and therefore this leads to a war. And most people look at this as China and the United States over Taiwan. But what if instead this becomes the rising power China supplanting the declining power Russia and a war happens over the resources of the rich area north of the Amur River again? I can cover more about that in the Q&A. But that, in essence, is the arguments that I make in, in my article. And Maya, I look forward to your, your further questions. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, this is, I, I think you really nicely summed up some of the main points of, of this piece. And I definitely have a follow-up question on China. But I want to go back a little bit more, go back to sort of the genesis of, of this report, the um, article, Amalric's essay, about uh, entitled, uh, Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that essay and how it inspired this piece, but also, you know, in, in hindsight, <laughs> with the benefit of, of uh, all these decades passing since that essay was written, um, you know, what are your thoughts about, um, you know, some of the key points there? For those of you who are not familiar, uh, Andrei Amalric was a Soviet dissident who in 1966 was exiled to Siberia. When he returned to European Russia in 1969, he wrote an essay called, Will the Soviet Union Survive Till 1984? And the year 1984 was suggested to him by some friends because that's the Orwellian year and it resounded um, well. Um, so his belief after coming back from Siberia was that the Soviet Union could not survive. And he had, he saw three possibilities for its future. The first was, which he thought there was no possibility whatsoever, was real reform. He says the communist system, the communist party will not allow this. The second option, which he kind of dismissed as impossible, would have been a, a military coup that shedded the outer garments of Marxist-Leninism and instead transition to an openly nationalist policy. Now, that is, especially if you've read Catherine Belton's book, Putin's People, that's what many assume has happened with Putin taking power in 2000. Instead of a military coup, you had an intelligence coup. Um, but an argument can be made that um, Amalric was right in more ways uh, than just the fall of the Soviet Union, which he foresaw in his third possible option is that the Soviet Union and China would get involved in a long, bloody war, and that this would lead to the breakup of the Soviet Union along nationalist lines, as did happen in uh, 1991. So he knew that unsuccessful wars brought down past regimes, and he believed that a war with China would push the Soviet regime into oblivion. Now, there are some that say that, OK, the war with China never happened. That's not what broke up the Soviet Union. Amalric was an accidental prophet. Um, but I'll say this for him. He had the foresight in the 1960s to look beyond the facade of omnipotence that many supposed for the Soviet Union and to say that the empire had no clothes. And he may not have had the path picked out correctly, but he certainly knew the Soviet Union's final destination. And if you read, uh, and I recommend it, it's only a 60 page essay and it's available on Amazon with some of his other essays. It's a small thin book for a few bucks. It holds close. His descriptions of the Soviet Union, which he considered as an Imperial Russia in a pre-revolutionary situation, read almost exactly like the situation in Russia today. So again, I highly recommend this book. And I learned about it as an undergrad um, at Penn, and then it was always in my mind. And what motivated me to write this article was my experiences in the 1990s and 2000s in the Caucasus in Central Asia, where I saw the great dominance initially after the fall of the Soviet Union of Moscow over these newly independent states be supplanted by China. And by the mid 2000s, it was clear which was the rising power and which was the declining power uh, in the region. And then when I retired in 2020, I wrote, actually I wrote a first draft, which was rejected by several magazines um, and 
part of them, my first title was, will Putin survive till 2024? Will Russia survive till 2084? My conclusion then was that Putin had control enough to last till 2024, unless he didn't handle a crisis well. Um, and now I've rewritten it for this to look at the long-term implications of the Ukrainian war, because as Amalric has written, as Russian history has shown, there's nothing like a failed war to cause internal unrest in Russia. It may not happen. I'm not saying it will. I'm saying it's an option and it's something we should discuss. And so go ahead with your next question so we can discuss it some more. Yeah, so actually, our, the, the first comment that came in from uh, Mr. Skotsko says, thank you for opening up a subject that is long overdue for examination. The West needs to spend more time on the long view and not just on which weapon systems to send uh, next to Ukraine. So when whenever we discuss you know, the war in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, um, oftentimes you hear, we would not want Russia to collapse, it would be a disaster. And then the conversation, that line of thinking sort of ends there, right? We don't really go into then the longer discussion, whether you want Russia to collapse or not, it is one of the possibilities, right? In, right. in one of the possible outcomes of this war. So I think it is really important to have this kind of a conversation and, and, and examine it. But um, I think to me, one of the most provocative, thought provoking part of this report is, is your discussion of China and China's role. Uh, many would discuss, uh, describe the current Russia-China relationship and alliance of convenience. You know, China has a very pragmatic approach towards Russia, so on and so forth. However, if we step back and take a longer view of Russia-China relationship, we'll see that it's quite, um, this is a bit of an exception rather than the norm, the, the current relationship. Uh, a few years ago, FPRI published an excellent book about Russia's Far East, where I had the honor of serving as a research um, researcher. And um, it was all about China's you know, designs over the Far East and China's influence over the Russian Far East. I guess my number one question here is how opportunistic do you expect China to be uh, if, if Russia is indeed in this chaos and turmoil? Again, we hear, especially the sort of Western analysts say, well, for the West, it really wouldn't be that great if Russia collapses. Do you think that's how China sees it too? Or do you think that, you know, again, they would just switch over to this opportunistic mode relationship, you know, pragmatic relationship, just like what they have now. But in that case, it would be a lot of land grab and sort of taking over whatever they can from Russia and its sphere of influence. Maya, that's, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, for this paper, that's the question, uh, the Russia-China future. And so let me answer that. And at the end, let me then kind of turn also to Mr. Skotsko's comments. This is the main question. Why might China be motivated to take Russian territory if it's already getting the resources uh, from it. And if, if I was a member of the Chinese Politburo uh, when such a subject came up, this would be the argument that I would be making, that this may not be necessary. Um, however, if statesmen only made wise decisions, we never would have had the war, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Nazi Germany never would have invaded the Soviet Union et cetera, et cetera, to the beginning of recorded time. So the answer to the question is what might motivate China uh, to take Russian land or, or to take somehow have greater influence or control over the area in the Russian Far East? I would say there are three reasons. And they're the three reasons Thucydides wrote about thousands of years ago about why states go to war. Honor, fear, and national interest. Let's look at honor, irredentism, as I mentioned before, recovering the lost lands of 160 years ago, which is nothing in Chinese historical uh, memory. Fear, if Russia ever was to fall into internal chaos or even civil war, uh, China may wish to have some sort of buffer to prevent the effects of this chaos reaching into its own land. And I'll return to this concept of a buffer just in a, in a second. And finally, national interest. If, Things get so bad in Russia that Moscow, Moscow can no longer 
guarantee the flow of natural resources from Russia uh, into China, China could be tempted into either seizing them for themselves or creating a client state uh, that can do this if Moscow cannot do to uh, internal chaos. There is um, historical precedence for this. If we go back just a hundred years ago to the Russian Civil War, in the first full year of the Russian Civil War, I was uh, rereading uh, Robert Bruce Lincoln's uh, book on it. And in 1918, between the Volga River and Vladivostok, there were 19 separate governments set up. And as an historical kind of a, a little bit of trivia, from 1920 to 1922, there was an autonomous uh, Far Eastern Republic that was set up as a buffer state between the Soviet forces further west in Siberia and the Japanese interventionists who had seized Vladivostok. And this was done uh, with Japanese uh, support. They wanted that buffer between them. What if China, in case of internal chaos in, in Russia, wants such a buffer or such a client state? What if you have some of the cries, oblasts, and two of the national republics in the Far East Federal District of Russia, Sakha and Buryatia, decide they no longer want to remain in the Russian Federation? Why stay in a place that is going to be, continue to be economically stagnant for, um, because of Western um, sanctions and the way that Moscow is ruling things? when they have such resources and could go on their own, possibly with Beijing's support. Just as I mentioned earlier about Beijing's support to Kazakhstan's territorial integrity, what if they extended that to a, an entity that arose from the chaos in Russia? So there could be more than just an invasion that could lead China to have control over the Russian Far East. Again, this is not determinism, this is a possibility. The bottom line is, as the century unfolds, there is a great geopolitical experiment going on to see just how few Russians can live east of Lake Baikal and have that territory still controlled by Moscow. The, the Far Eastern Federal District has, as the 2020 Russian census shows, this is their statistics, 8 million people, probably even less now. In the three Chinese provinces alone bordering this area, there are 130 million people. This is a huge demographic mass or black hole next to a vast demographic vacuum. So we will see what, as the century unfolds, what happens as the balance of power, political, military, and demographic uh, leads and events lead to over who has control of the Russian Far East. Again, I'm not saying that this is deterministic, but this is possible. And regarding this question for our own foreign policy debates, to pick up what Mr. Scottsko raised, um, in December in FPRI on the website, and it can still be uh, seen by those of you who are watching, there was an excellent article by Mr. Thomas Lynch on the same question about managing Russia's decline and China's rise. And his argument was that the United States should not want and should try and prevent a collapse of Russia, because if it did so, then in the global balance of power, this would benefit China, who's our main geopolitical rival. It's an interesting argument, uh, but it's an argument that should be made and we should be making in the think tank community and hopefully in the greater national security community. Uh, and I think for this reason, um, if we look back to the greatest shock we've had so far in this century, the attacks of 9-11, the 9-11 Commission report clearly states that one of the reasons this happened was because of a lack of imagination in the national security apparatus. Well, as this war in Ukraine unfolds, we should not have a similar lack of imagination of what could happen to Russia or the world's largest nuclear powers um, as the war continues and as sanctions continue and as events continue to unfold. So it's things to discuss, to prepare for at least mentally, and maybe also to have contingency plans for. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was a great answer because my, my next question was going to be about, okay, where does this put the United States? So thank you for covering that as well because we have quite a few audience questions that have come in. So I'm going to get into those, but Meanwhile, I want to remind everyone that if you just look at the webinar chat section of your screen, 
that's where the the report is is linked and uh, Kayla has also just posted the um, article by Mr. Lynch that Phil just mentioned so thank you for that um, all right well let's continue um, let's continue this discussion with some other audience questions Jack Buchanan asks if Putin is removed who among the Kremlin crowd do you see succeeding him? So while we're speculating about potential scenarios, let me add really quickly there, because we've been seeing so much about Navalny, who is imprisoned, as most of you know, if you have any comments about sort of the potential outcomes there about Navalny's future, um, I, I've heard some speculation that he, you know, Maybe in the government's interest to neutralize him. If Putin is removed, who in the crowd do you see succeeding him? Well, I'm not going to pick a particular person because literally God, God only knows. Um, I would say for those who are wondering if Navalny could eventually have um, become president of Russia, I say that is probably the least likely of opportunities. Uh, what? will replace Putin may be just more of the same uh, from the national security crowd, the Siloviki who run the operation. Um, we are probably unlikely to see in the unrest that would come about from a um, defeat in Ukraine, a liberal democratic revolution. It would be nice and it could be one of the options. And we've had uh, editorials by Kasparov and Khodorovsky pushing for this idea. But I think the events would not go in that way. That's my estimate. If one just looks at the reaction to the average Russian to the death of Gorbachev last summer and sees that Russia uh, did not, does not probably want to go down that path again, unfortunately. But I think that's the reality. Navalny, the brave man that he is. I mean, here's a man who was poisoned by his own government, had to uh, flee to Germany in order to get treatment to survive. And then upon when everyone told him not to, he had the courage to return to uh, Russia uh, to continue a struggle and then was arrested by the state and thrown into jail for breaking his parole. I mean, somewhere in the afterlife, Franz Kafka is kicking himself for not imagining such a scenario for one of his, his novels. But I could not see Navalny if there was ever such unrest in Russia um, surviving. Uh, his jail time so that he could be released from the Bastille and lead a liberal democratic revolution. I think that's unlikely that he could survive. As far as who else, I don't know. But as I said earlier, remember, we have now a number of armed formations in the Russian government, loyalty to different uh, leaders, different factions. And there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to agree. Putin balances between them. With Putin gone, uh, who's going to do the, who's going to balance per the Russian constitution. If he was to depart for whatever reasons, including health reasons, the prime minister Mish Mishutin becomes president, acting president for only 90 days. There's supposed to be elections. We know elections do nothing more than ratify decisions that are already made in the Kremlin ahead of time. And I think it would be exceptional at this time if all the different factions could agree and the chaos could result. Again, I'm saying this is not what will happen, but this could happen, and we should be prepared uh, for that. Thank you, Phil. I'm going to combine these two questions. One is asking, do you see General Gerasimov as someone having the potential to being turned into a political figure? And then the second, so all, all these dis potentially disastrous scenarios that you lay out, is this something that is of concern at some level within Russia? And is that one of the reasons why Putin continues to receive continued popular support? Certainly, we've seen a lot of fear mongering from Putin's side over the, the past many years, actually, about what could go wrong um, if, if he is overthrown. But go ahead. Karasimov uh, and then Putin's popular support. Okay. Again, I don't again, I don't want to try and pick a particular name. There are going to be many people vying for the throne. Uh, who wins it is, is an open question. I'm just saying be prepared for it not to go smoothly and for it possibly to go very wrong. And I think that this is something that is feared within the Kremlin by Putin himself. And that 
this is one of the reasons uh, why he probably will keep the war going. As long as the war is going, the bicycle is going forward, he's probably less likely to be overthrown unless till there's a final defeat. Um, so what could, you know, what could come next? Um, chaos. Uh, the term in Russian is bezpredel, without limits. Is, that was a term used in, in the 90s. And this is one thing that the Russian people themselves have always feared is anarchy. Anarchy is even worse than repression in, in this, the culture in many, for many Russians. So this is kind of what has kept um, right now Russians supporting the war, supporting Putin to a certain extent. However, if the war is ir um, um, lost, clearly lost, the Russian army falls apart. Uh, Crimea is the key. If Crimea is retaken by the Ukrainians, that is the real sign that Russia has lost the war and has been humiliated. Then Russian nationalism uh, will come to the fore and people will demand a change. And then we'll see how the change goes. Um, again, Putin is not gonna be thrown out because he started this war or, or for the, the criminal acts done in waging it. He would be thrown out because he lost the war. And we have to accept that this is the, this is the general attitude uh, for the general um, um, Russian society as certainly as well as its elites. Thank you, Phil. I have a question from Brian Duffy that, that's quite similar to what you just said, but um, what, what conditions would you assess as contributing to, to a potential change of leadership in Russia regarding a potential defeat in Ukraine? Loss of gained territory, excessive loss of Russian blood and treasure, and then he says, thanks again for this discussion. So vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, what would be the sort of what will constitute that defeat? 2013 was probably the high watermark of Putin's regime. Uh, they just finished the uh, Sochi Olympics. Uh, the economy had been on a seven year roll. And then when he in the um, is a retaliation for the Maidan uprising and the throwing out of his favored uh, president, uh, he went and seized uh, Crimea, and the public reaction to this sent his ratings skyrocketing. Well, and Crimea is a very visceral, and Ukraine in general in itself is a very visceral subject uh, for the average Russian. It is will be the loss of Ukraine that I think will be the greatest psychological blow, and that will start the ball rolling uh, towards, as I mentioned, popular unrest. A uh, popular unrest, demonstrations, things like this, they don't have to break through the Kremlin gates to change power. They just have to break through the mentality of the Siloviki of the Kremlin elites themselves that they could lose power to make sure that they don't. Remember again, as former FPRI member Alvin Z. Rubenstein once taught me, the first rule of politics is thou shalt stay in power. So I think that is the primary uh, thing that would be a catalyst. The heavy loss of life for the elites, this doesn't matter. At a certain point, certainly for the families, it, it will. Certainly it does for those who've already lost people. The, uh, the, the level of casualties um, are, I don't know how to describe them. I read the Russian telegram and social media and all of that. We are getting into territory of, of over possibly um, not only 100,000 casualties, but if you group all of the different groups, Wagner, Roskibardia, and all of them together, we could have over 100,000 deaths soon. Uh, and then you add the wounded, the permanently uh, crippled, things like this. This is a major segment of Russian society and people are gonna want answers. They're gonna wanna know why. And again, they probably in general, Russian society would accept these losses if there is some sort of victory that can be claimed, will not accept them if there is a definite humiliating defeat. Thank you, Phil. Um, your report also touches on Turkey and Turkey's role um, in, in the current conflict, but also in these likely scenarios you speak about. Charles Boran asks, what, what, what role would Turkey play in a new Russian civil war? I think this is a really good area to delve a little bit deeper into. Wow, that, that is a very interesting question. Um, and whatever role it's gonna play would be to increase its interest. It, it's funny, when the Soviet Union was first created, uh, they did a covert action where they sent arms to Ataturk in his war against the Greeks um, to help um, shore up the new Turkish Republic. 
I doubt you'd see a reverse of that. However, what you would definitely see is that Turkey would establish itself, uh, its interest in the South Caucasus, especially vis-a-vis -vis the uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Karabakh. That would be resolved um, probably um, to favor of Turkish national interest, as well as Azerbaijanis. Um, I don't know what um, this would mean regarding uh, Turkish influence um, in Central Asia. Um, but uh, something we'd have to look at is also your native Georgia. This is exclusive of Turkey, but what would be the Georgian uh, decision? Would there be an attempt to take Abkhazia and South Ossetia back by force? Or as one of my Georgian friends mentioned to me, he hopes cooler heads would prevail. And this could be done through negotiations between the two sides to peacefully reunite the country. But it's an excellent question. I, I wish I had a crystal ball where I could see that clearly into the future. But the bottom line is Turkey, as well as other countries on the periphery, will certainly use whatever chaos there is to both enhance their positions, but also to make sure they themselves are secure, as I mentioned about China as well. Because if there was to ever be violence as in Russia, internal violence on the scale of 100 years ago, it will be a very horrible event in human history. I hope one that we could avoid. Thank you, Phil. Um, you may have seen re recently published a report by um, Raphael Parents about uh, the Wagner Group and how it, it is going to sort of reform and redefine itself after such significant losses in Ukraine. He's in the audience and asks you a question. Do you see the Russian military continuing to uh, privatize into into the future? For example, the Wagner Group's expansion in war fighting ops in Ukraine what would this mean for the Russian general staff and perhaps for its nuclear forces? And I'm going to paste uh, Raphael's FPRI report here in the um, chat for our audience members to see. Uh, very good question. For starters, the Russian general staff hates Prigozhin. Uh, that is returned in kind. The last thing they want to see is other Wagner type groups uh, being created. I've seen rumors in Russian social media of another private military company being created to kind of balance Wagner. And that would provide, again, if you want to think of this in terms of medieval court, another courtier, another armed retainer who could be called upon by Putin to support himself if times get bad. But I believe what the Russian military itself would want to see is that Wagner, as it's doing now, just exhausts itself in the Donbass, uh, destroys itself, and then they can deal with Prigozhin when the time when the time comes. In the meantime, Wagner serves a, an important role in that its troops, along with some of the special forces, still have what we call the Marine Corps, the will to combat, the will to advance and to fire, and has kept the initiative and has, this winter goes on, has at least had one positive uh, impact on the war for Russia. It's prevented Ukraine from being able to seize the initiative during the winter strike the new recruits who are in the trenches. Um, so in this aspect, Wagner has been useful, but we should also kind of look, let's go back to my um, supposition that the Russian army could collapse as I've written about also earlier. If that happens and if Wagner is part of that, let's remember what Russia has just done over the past six months. It's taken its criminal class, armed them, sent them to war, and those who are after in only six month contracts uh, are coming back in society. If there was to be widespread violence, you could expect these groups to be part of it. We already have press reporting of one group that was in Kyrgyzstan that left with their weapons and went into Crimea as basically to engage in banditry and the FSB is literally still hunting them down. Imagine that magnified by a thousand groups of 20 or so armed men who come back into Russia and to add to a totally chaotic situation. This is one of the possible uh, consequences of arming Wagner, of recruiting from the prisons. And it's an unintended consequence, uh, but it is possible. And we've been seeing also some good reporting is what is happening now as these people return to Russian society. 
Thank you, Phil. I'm going to uh, combine these two questions. By the way, thank you everyone for sending in such excellent questions. Um, so the next two questions, one asks, uh, how likely is the true defeat of Russia and Ukraine, especially when Moscow has WMDs to fall back on? And then the other one, consider that Russia recovers and actually conquers Ukraine. What happens then? So again, I, we have lots of sort of likely scenarios and speculation, and that's definitely thought provoking. So I really like this discussion. Those are two possible scenarios. Uh, right now in Ukraine, the issue is in doubt. And we do not know how exactly the war will end. The, um, the war could end with a Ukrainian victory, and I've already laid out that of what that would look like. The, it's, for me, it's hard to see how it could end in a Russian victory. It could end in some sort of um, status quo that the Russians could claim as victory. But let's suppose that I'm, I'm wrong in my argument, especially my first argument, that there is no collapse of the Russian army. The Ukrainians in the near term do not take back um, Crimea. What then? Um, what we would have is probably less of a frozen conflict and more of a war of attrition. As a matter of fact, what we have now is a war of attrition. But a war of attrition is along the lines of what happened between Israel and Egypt in the early 1970s along the Suez Canal. Now let's consider what that then means for Russia. Western sanctions continue. Um, the Russian economy therefore continues to decline. Russia has lost its gas market in Europe. It's losing a large part of its oil market and that oil that it does sell is at a discount even to the Asian countries. So its sources of uh, income are gonna decline. Uh, the Russian GDP from the high water mark in 2013 has already declined by over a third. It was once 2.4 trillion. Uh, at the last, um, according to IMF figures, it's 1.7 trillion, and that's before we even calculated 2022. It's, it is going to be a continuing economic uh, demographic uh, decline throughout the country. Russia could end up becoming a state very similar, if you think about it, in some ways to North Korea, which is dependent on China for exporting its raw materials, It'll threaten its neighbors with nuclear weapons uh, to protect itself a bit. It's going to increase repression at home, and uh, it's going to have a growingly autarkic economy. Well, that's good for keeping control. It's certainly not going to revive its military. Uh, the military capability will continue to decline. They'll have to go on to a wartime economy for God knows how long to maintain a 600 plus mile front with soldiers. Uh, for as long as this conflict with Ukraine continues until Ukraine gathers strength and probably a new war because Russia could gain strength, Ukraine can gain strength. So, uh, and this brings me back to my original um, argument in the article is that Russia is gonna continue to decline. I'll go out on a limb here and say, we don't know how the war will end, but I think we already know its conclusions. Wars, as Clausewitz said, are fought, are fought for political purposes. Then we know what political uh, results will be from the war. One, Ukraine is going to become a Western-oriented country, join its Western institutions with time, and have a and join the liberal democratic uh, group of nations in the Atlantic Alliance. Be that through the EU, NATO, with time, or just be a member in spirit. The second conclusion, Russia will continue to decline. As I just mentioned the reasons, economically, militarily, demographically. And as this decline continues, let me return to my final argument about Russian Chinese power and the balance of power in the Far East. I mean, the question is again, as the century unfolds, how long will Russia be able to last as an Asian power? In the end, it'll probably be up for China to decide whether it wants to have a weak vassal in Russia or something else. Phil, um, I have a question here by Michael Marsh. Um, sorry, not, not that one, no. I have, I already asked that one. Um, I have a question about uh, Ramzan Kadyrov. Um, in, in these scenarios, would he be a, a Putin uh, backer or a foe? Um, so 
Kadyrov, the the head of uh, Chechnya. This is a very I want to expand on this because it's a very good example of a, a, a relationship that is entirely sort of loyalty that Putin has essentially pur- purchased. Right. So um, Kadyrov, you know, sort of swears his loyalty to Putin is like Putin is like God to him and. He's a good example, right? And Chechnya is a good example of a territory that's sort of being kept under Russia's control, just barely and at a very high cost, but also a relationship that is definitely based on these kinds of individual um, dynamics and a lot of corruption. Um, So what do you think would happen to some of these relationships, not just in Chechnya, arguably even in Georgia, even in some of the other neighboring countries where Putin has just poured a lot of money uh, to gain political influence, where would that go in case of um, a, a weak Putin? Kadyrov is an excellent example of two points of, of my paper. First, let's talk about the internal unrest, possibility of coup, possibility of coup going wrong and leading to, again, civil war, or certainly uh, major fighting within major cities. Um, yes, Kadyrov has uh, pledged his loyalty to Putin, and he wouldn't lie. Um, we're actually getting back into almost the medieval ages uh, with Russian government, where the Tsar surrounds himself by his boyars, his armed retainers, and they protect him in exchange for, for favors uh, from the state. Um, and we're also getting into kind of the territory of uh, what uh, FPR, one of FPRI's most distinguished uh, um, members, uh, Robert D. Kaplan says, it's all about geopolitics until it becomes about Shakespeare. And I think with Russia, we're starting to enter Shakespearean territory uh, with the, fa- you know, with the fighting for power that could come uh, if Putin leaves the scene, however naturally or unnaturally. Kadyrov, Prigozhin could support Putin. And like I said, they are similar to a medieval court, his armed retainers. What if they turn on him? What if they decide they want power? This is what I talked about earlier. So there's that one aspect. He's loyal up until the point when he's not. And either way is a calculus uh, that Putin cannot totally depend upon. It also then leads us to what about the ethnic republics? Right now, yes, Chechnya is one of the most loyal uh, along with Dagestan. They each vote 110% in the elections uh, for the current president. But um, Kadyrov runs Chechnya uh, as Quisling ran Norway. And he has made a lot of enemies. And if Moscow's power should all of a sudden collapse, there's a good chance that all those families who Kadyrov has killed them as their neighbor, this is the Caucasus, remember, you're a Georgian Maya, you understand this, uh, there is um, certainly impetus for blood feuds and for also for other groups to try and overthrow Kadyrov. You have Chechen fighters on both sides of the battle in Ukraine. You have Chechens, many of them Islamists, uh, in, um, in Syria and other places who would certainly return home if they thought there was a chance to overthrow Kadyrov. So we have a very dangerous uh, situation here. Uh, Kadyrov, if Moscow loses control, uh, Kadyrov could lose control. And that also raises for the United States an interesting policy uh, issue. What if these, most of these national, uh, almost all of these national republics are Muslim? What if they try to secede and in their independence movements are taken over by Islamic, violent Salafist extremists as the Chechen independence movement under the Dayev was. What is gonna be our reaction then? This is again, something we should be preparing for and discussing um, and trying to gather information on. So I see those kind of two sides of the coin of the Kadyrov question, but Kadyrov is an excellent um, canary in the coal mine, so to speak, to what may happen in the future for Russia. Yeah, and that's a great segue to the next set of questions. I'm gonna keep combining them for the sake of time management. So. Uh, by the way, the Kadyrov question was by uh, Danny Lofton. Um, so uh, Ivan Foman asks, in case there's a confrontation between Russia and China, which side will the U.S. support? We touched that a little bit about how important this is for the U.S. to consider. 
And on that, Adrian Basora asks, if he were advising President Biden, what would you advise him to do to exploit some of Putin's and Russia's vulnerabilities that you have laid out? So the Russia-China conflict, and then how to exploit uh, Russia's von current vulnerabilities. Uh, in a conflict between Russia and China, I hope the side that the United States takes is its own. And depending on the circumstances, it should react in a way that increases US security. I know that sounds boilerplate, but I think that's what we should do. So I would not even try and say we should take one side or the other or any, any side, but we should be prepared, like I said, at least mentally for such an event and have some contingency plans initially of how to react. And again, to protect our own security, especially with regards to nuclear weapons. Um, could you, uh, the, second, the second question that came in. If you were advising President Biden, how would you advise him to sort of take advantage of Putin's and Russia's vulnerabilities, the ones that you laid out in your report? Um, we have to make sure that the Ukrainians uh, win this war. Um, otherwise, it will continue on. The Ukrainians have done great service in destroying a good part of Russian military power so that it cannot threaten the NATO states, especially the ones with a less advantageous geographic position, such as the Baltics. But Russian power eventually can uh, revive itself, as we've seen in history. Uh, so we have to make sure that Russia is defeated, and we have to make sure that Ukraine has the arms to do so. To do otherwise is not in our own security interest. This is not charity. This is for our own security interests and the interests of our allies and partners. And to prevent us to have to again station a large amount of US troops and equipment in Europe when we have other even greater security concerns in the Pacific. I would advise him to stop incrementalism in providing arms because an enemy begins to be able to adapt to this. And I would also advise, as I've written with a colleague of mine, uh, Jim Petrilla, a couple of articles for Lawfare, uh, Wagner needs to be declared as a foreign terrorist organization. Not so much for what's going, it's doing in Ukraine, which are definite war crimes, but for its terrorism in support of political objectives of the Russian Federation in Africa. And its uh, exploitation of countries' gold and diamonds and other mineral resources which are invading international sanctions and helping Russia finance this war and, find, and being able to stay afloat, especially having lost so much revenue, no longer with arms sales, oil sales, or gas sales. This could really harm Russia without having to take the steps of declaring Russia itself as a terrorist state, which I think should not be done because that could lead to a breach of diplomatic relations and I believe that if there's one thing we should do right now is to try and have as many lines of communication open to the Russians as possible in case we do have such internal chaos in Russia. We need to be able to communicate people across a wide spectrum of society, political, economic, religious, military, especially military. So again, for whatever happens, does not harm US national security. Thank you, Phil, and thanks for asking James Petri answering James Petrilla's question. Uh, we have some really good questions. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I have to ask this one last question because I think it's incredibly important. Thank you for a very thoughtful webinar. You already talked about the Caucasus and what about Belarus uh, and its future with its economy, semi-independent, Soviet-style army. What could we expect there? And especially for neighbors, Baltic states, Poland. Um, this is from Evaldus Labanauskas. So this will be our last question, but really, really important. What about Belarus? I'll try and be succinct. First, I do not see the Belarusian army joining in directly attacking Ukraine because Lukashenko knows that if his army is destroyed in the same ways that Russia is destroyed, there's nothing then to keep him in power. Um, if Putin falls, if Russia turns into internal chaos, uh, I think then there would be an impetus for the forces that demonstrated after the elections in 2020 in Belarus to make another attempt uh, to regain power, we would see. If um, a Putin-like government eventually takes um, a hold in Moscow, uh, I would believe that they would support Belarus just as strongly, if not more than Putin has, uh, because they know that if Belarus was to take the same uh, path uh, towards the West as Ukraine is going to and the Baltics already have, uh, that is the, um, 
uh, that is even a greater nightmare, I think, than Ukraine uh, joining NATO, because from the path, as you know, from Warsaw to Moscow through Smolensk and Minsk has been the historic invasion uh, route um, to Russia. And I know those in the Russian national security sphere would see that as an absolute disaster, uh, because then it's only a few hundred miles from Belarus's eastern border to Moscow. So I would see um, a Putin-like government supporting Belarus just as strongly as Putin has, but that if Russia goes into chaos and is not able to support them, you could see, again, civil unrest in Belarus like you did after the 2020 elections. After that, I will, uh, I will turn off my crystal ball of what could happen. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for such an interesting discussion. And I want to thank our audience members for one of the best Q and A's I have ever moderated, honestly. So thank you for, for being here with us and participating. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it's devastating to say, but in, in less than a month, we will be approaching one year marker since Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine, a war that still goes on and is unlikely to be over by that one year marker. So um, FPRI has a lot of special programming prepared and plenty of analysis articles and reports coming between now and the end of February. So I want to ask everyone to keep an eye on FPRI.org. Make sure you're subscribed to our newsletters and follow us on our social media channels. Um, you will be hearing plenty more from Phil as well. Our goal here is to inform our audience members to keep them engaged and to to keep keep our um, to keep the wheels in motion in, in thinking about these problems and not just today and tomorrow but like we saw in Phil's report and in this discussion the bigger picture questions so thank you everyone for participating thank you Phil for being with us today thank you for your time and I wish everyone a great rest of your day. Be sure to subscribe to Chain Reaction on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to be notified about new episodes. To explore more from the Foreign Policy Research Institute's research, podcasts, and upcoming events, please visit us on www.fpri.org.